Welcome back, everybody, to another episode of the Back Lounge Podcast. My name is Tank, I'm your host, and I'm a retired roadie with over 15 years of experience in the touring music industry. And in today's episode, this is actually kind of wild because in three episodes, we're already getting two members of Sabaton on here because today's special guest is going to be vocalist and founding band member, Joachim Brodian, and I'm super excited, man, because in the first episode, we had their drummer, Hannes Van Dahl. And since he was on here, some new stuff has happened, mainly their brand new album, The War to End All Wars, came out. They had a brand new music video that was released to YouTube, and there are some questions about those things that I wish I could have asked Hannes, but today I'm going to have the chance to ask Joachim, and I'm super excited about it, man. But before we get started with today's episode, let's take a second to talk about this episode's sponsor, me, which seems kind of weird to say, but I recently just released my own merchandise line, and I just want to take a second to talk about it with everybody. You know, there are some things I've learned as a content creator as I go, and I feel like every day I learn more things, but I've noticed that most every other content creator does have a line of their own merch, which is a way for people to help support their content while getting something back. So I finally decided to do that. So if you head over to tankthetechmerch.com, you'll see a whole line of introductory stuff that is now available to the public. We've got hoodies, t-shirts, tank tops, long sleeves, and we've got stickers and coffee mugs and stuff like that too. And like I said, this is just a way for people to support my content while getting something in return. And not only that, man, um, some of the designs that are on here were actually made by people in our community. Some of the designs were made by my wife. And one of the main designs on here, if you check out the website, you'll see a skull that has a beard and the logo and stuff on there. That was designed by a girl named Alexandra. She's on our Discord community and stuff like that. And she made this logo and just gave it to me as a piece of fan art. But I was like, this is way too cool. I want to use this. But I wanted to take care of her too because she's an artist. So any piece of merch that you buy with that skull logo on it, I'm splitting the profits with her because like I said, she's an artist. I didn't just want to use her logo and I feel like it's the least we can do to take care of her for making such a cool piece of art. Now, all of this stuff on here is available in different colors, different sizes, tons of different options, and it actually ships from the US and Europe. So for you Europeans that are listening, you're not going to have to deal with customs or anything crazy like that. And on top of that, Anybody that's a member of my Patreon gets a 10% off discount code that you can get when you sign up for Patreon. And if you're already a member, that's accessible to you now. So once again, www.tankthetechmerch.com. Don't feel obligated to get anything, but if you would like to, it's not only supporting me, it's supporting other artists and you get something in return for being kind enough to support this content. But let's just jump into this episode. I'm super excited. I know you guys just want to jump in too. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, Joachim Brodian of Sabaton. Joachim, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you for having me. Yeah, man, this is going to be fun. I mean, we've already sat here for a couple minutes and had some laughs, and I figured it was probably time to actually start this. So <laughs> Yeah, I know um, <laughs> Yeah, this is um, the second earliest I've gotten up to do a podcast with the time changes. I think when I I talked to Tom from Evergrey for an interview on the channel, I think I got up at five my time, which with the time change at the time, I think it was noon in Sweden. Oh, yeah. Yeah, not too bad. Or maybe I did that (laughs) math wrong. Now, today's fine. Like I told you, it's 830 here right now, and we're usually up at like 630 anyways with our kid, like... Right before I, it's it's actually funny the process of get, getting into this um, and getting started this morning. I was actually finishing up cooking an, an omelet for my daughter, and my wife was like, "Hey, don't you need to go get started?" And I was like, "Oh yeah, it's like eight twenty-five. I'll see you later." <laughs> so, but uh, but this will be fun, man. You know, before we started, it was it was interesting. We were just you know I was kind of doing my pre you know podcast interview stuff with you and. You had brought up the fact that, um, you know, you guys don't have outside management. The whole band is ran by you guys. Like you guys get to choose your schedule and what you do. And has it, have you guys ever really had a manager? Or is it always just you guys the whole career? 
Uh, we, we tried twice to involve people for a very short amount of time, but uh, never worked out, really. I mean, in the beginning, it's not by choice. It by, it's by necessity. Uh, we, mm-hmm. uh, we wanted a manager who had some connections who could, you know, get us where we wanted to be faster, uh, I guess, um, back in the days. But right now, no, we're happy where we are. Uh, nobody's going to care as much as about, about Sabaton as we are going to do. Mm-hmm. And um, but it's it would be unfair to say that it's only like us in the band doing it. We sort of built an organization which would be partly doing a management. So we have people, of, of course, helping us out uh, and advising us. Yeah, for the most part, though. I mean, you know, I look at a lot of other bands that have um, you know management. Obviously, you guys have booking agents and stuff like that, but and the record label, but there's a lot of things that you guys do on your own. I mean, I had a short conversation with Per not uh, t- terribly long ago, and he was, you know, you guys run all your merchandise operations and stuff like that. And that's, you know, that's huge because a lot of bands have to have outside printers or stuff like that. And like the fact that you guys have your hands into your own merchandise is great because you can get all of your own products whenever you want you can design whatever you want and put out whatever you want yeah i mean it's i i do understand why other bands don't do it because it's a shit ton of work (laughs) and doing it but at the same time you know we tried to have other people at a certain point but if we weren't happy with the results we had the sort of the same thing as the management thing there we weren't happy with the what we were getting sort of so we had to build our own infrastructure and sort of get things going on that mm-hmm. part as well which in now in hindsight is really good but you know uh that's the luck of having somebody like par in a band you know <laughs> yeah <laughs> who uh, i remember wha- a couple of years ago i think this is uh probably quite a few years ago but we uh he called me and he said dude we gotta do something can i book a show somewhere because we were doing songwriting period. So I had my ass full because I usually deal with most of the musical side and he deals with most of the business stuff. And he called me and said, you know, I'm understimulated. I need to do something. Can we book a show? Can we do something? I'm like, yeah, I'm, we can do something. I'm coming along quite nice with the <laughs> songwriting. And then I asked him, so what have you been doing today? Oh, I went up at seven. I had breakfast, watched the news. Then I worked. Then I had lunch uh, in town with Kister. Uh, and then I went back to work and now it's five o'clock and I got nothing to do. I'm like, <laughs> you, you basically described a nine hour working day and you're understimulated. What the fuck is wrong? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's so you guys started the band together. Did you guys play together before Sabaton and other projects or did you, do you guys just know each other before that? Or did you find each other when you started Sabaton? Uh, you no, know, we had no idea about each other. Um, if we go back all the way to 99, in early 99, um, my friend Richard, who was, uh, I was playing drums with basically at school break. We were in, I guess, I guess you would call it high school or mm-hmm. something like that in America. And, um, he started with a bunch of guys, uh, playing, he's a drummer, this Richard guy. And, um, uh, after a while, they asked me if I want to come to a party and they were looking for a keyboarder. And that's how I got into the band. And that's the first time I met Pat uh, oh, at wow. all. So um, until we started playing together, I'd only met him drunk once at a party, basically. Yeah. When, I, when I was like 18 or 19. I, I was 18 at the time, I think. And uh, then we walked into the rehearsal room and i asked them okay so what what are we playing here and it turns out they didn't have any songs of their own but they were doing a bunch of covers so we started playing a few covers and they found out that uh, i wrote songs so i showed them a few songs i'd written and uh, well they didn't have a singer at all uh, so they asked me can you sing so we know what the vocal melodies you you had intended were and yeah and they told me well you'll sing until we find a singer lazy bastards yeah and then never found a singer i mean that's yeah. th- that's the the origin story is great though because that's how most of the bands in my area started it's like i grew up near chicago but far enough outside of it that the town i grew up in was like 
5,000 people in the middle of a cornfield because all of Illinois outside of Chicago is pretty much just farmland. And it's like we would just meet other musicians from around the area at drunk at parties when we were teenagers and stuff and then be like, hey, man, you want to start a band? And that's pretty yeah. much how everything went, you know? And it was that was those were fun times because I remember I remember going to like bonfires and barn parties and stuff where there would just be a, a random band from another high school playing and we'd get to know everybody else's music. And some of the bands in our area actually, you know, turned out um, to get signed and got pretty big. And, you know, the Chicago music scene was cool because if we went into the suburbs, we could see. I remember seeing like Rise Against and Fall Out Boy and Chevelle and all those bands when they were nothing when they first started. And it was, yeah. it's like cool to see where everybody is now. And, um, you know, I always, I always enjoy seeing how bands started. And when I first discovered you guys doing the YouTube stuff, the funniest thing is I had, I had heard Sabaton's name forever. I actually had a guy on one of my tours, a production manager on one of my tours that used to talk about you guys all the time because he also tour managed uh, Apocalyptica when they toured in the US. So he made that connection and was like, yeah, you got to check okay. out Sabaton. So it was funny when I first checked out your band and then, um, you know, people were like, you need to go back, like go way back. <laughs> and I remember, I remember watching a festival I think it was in like 2005. I can't remember which festival it was, but it was a performance of Primo Victoria from way back in the day. Uh, probably Sweden Rock with funny haircuts and stage clothes. I think it was. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it was, it was so funny because it, it's interesting how you perceive music when you first hear it. Because I was like, yeah, this is a really, this is a really cool song. I don't know if this is like my favorite that I've heard so far. But I turned it into a double reaction and did the one from Woodstock only like seven years later in Poland. And it was like <laughs> just so massive. And Primo Victoria has now turned into one of my favorite songs. Um, was that one of the first songs that you guys wrote that got into the military and historical aspect of Sabaton? Or did you have songs before that too? We had a few. A pan, song called Panzer Battalion was actually mm -hmm. before. Oh, but uh, I think Prima Victoria is really a pivotal song in many senses because that's the song when we wrote those lyrics, me and Pat, we thought we can't sing about you know boobs or beer or you know killing mm -hmm. dragons with this one. Yeah, we decided to write the song about D-Day and. At that point, we realized that all of a sudden writing lyrics wasn't a necessary evil anymore. But hey, this is actually interesting. Our, yeah. our song means something now. So in many ways, that song put us down the path of singing about military history. And also while recording it, it's the first time we sort of used, well, the sort of choir arrangements from a Lutheran hymn almost, uh, how we... Yeah. Uh, put the harmony vocals there and I remember the rest of the boys in the band were really really skeptical about the whole prospect so the song starts with your voice no reverb no nothing yes <laughs> yeah <laughs> then, uh, well that's the first song of the album what's the intro that is the intro <laughs> yeah. okay and uh, when we did the harmony vocals We'd never done something like that before, uh, and it was hard to explain to the other ones that we're singing in these different harmonies, and we had a tough time to get, get making it work, so we had to sort of break it down. I remember Pat was in the control room because he was doing the recording. We are recording at night because we didn't have much money, and it was a self-financed uh, thing, uh, doing demos and albums in the early days, and uh, we'd sort of have Tommy Tekkeren, Peter Tekkeren from Hypocrisy and Payne's brother, was recording us in those days and uh we sort of when he went home we kept on going for six or eight more hours you know to try and record yep. everything yep and pat was pressing the record button basically in the control room and it was me and the guitarists standing there and i told them okay first we sing to the gates of hell as we make our way to heaven through the nazi lines and now we sing to the gates of hell as we make our way to heaven through the nazi lines and now we copy my main melody through the gates of hell and uh we sort of had to isolate them all. So we never heard everything um, at the same time. But when I told Pat then sort of like, okay, now we take all of these three channels, uh, put them up and play them together and lots of reverb on there. And at that moment, that was probably the first time we thought, wow, this is actually good. 
in as in good good not yeah. in good, good to be us good you know <laughs> yeah those those moments in the studio are great man because i i relate to everything you're saying like when i was in a band you know early on we early on when you start a band you don't have the luxuries of finances and time and like you know the first i would consider like serious band i was in we all had to work nine to five jobs and all that money we were making we were basically putting back into the band to record demos and stuff like that and then staying in the studio until like 2 a.m 3 a.m i remember the first time we went into a studio with an actual engineer and producer we're like this is amazing like we don't have to do anything ourselves you know yeah. And it's and it's somebody it's, who actually knows what they're doing. Is yeah, doing yeah. And it's and it's funny because it, those moments in the studio where you first come up with an idea, sometimes that idea in your head is like, or in your head, you already know how the final version of it is that you want it to sound like. So you have to convince all the other guys in the band like this will sound good. And then it's cool to see that magic when you finally get it all together and play it back how it should be for the first time. And everybody's like, yep. oh, yeah, like no, this, this, yeah. this does work, man. And that's 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 great, man. I love that. And the the history aspect. And I know you guys get this a lot because, um, you know, it's a very unique thing. I know there are a couple other bands that do similar stuff, but for you guys to do what you do is very cool. I like that you said, like, you know, we could, can't just sing about boobs and beers and stuff like that. It's like tons of other bands do that. Like, yeah. I think um, In Flames had a joke on one of their live DVDs where, uh, like, I think they were introducing a song and he's like, yeah, this next one that we're going to play for you is called Boobs and Beers. <laughs> like, <Okay. laughs> yeah, and it was it was one of their other songs. But to be clear, I, I got nothing wrong against Boobs and Beers, you know. Uh, oh, I mean, yeah, there are know. enough bands doing it. And, uh, <laughs> All already been perfected by Steel Panther. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of <laughs> a lot of other bands as well. Yeah. Um, but man, it's it's just cool for me, especially. And I'm sure you've heard this, but as an American, learning about some of the history that you guys sing about has been really cool because we don't learn about this stuff in our school system. The way we learn about things is very is very US centric. If we were involved in something, we'll learn about it, you know, but there are parts of World War One and World War Two and stuff that I've learned about specifically from your music because we were never taught that in school. Ah, because it happened before you joined in. Exactly. So they don't they don't teach us the full history of things. They just teach us the history once the USA got involved. Oh yeah. Um, well, it's similar in many countries. Uh, yeah. Sweden being a much smaller country, of course, has uh aren't as swedish centric but still very swedish centric but mm -hmm. not as much but uh yeah i mean it would make total sense every country has its own history and we you know what's common knowledge for school kids in brazil is stuff that we never heard about you know yeah and it it's even stuff as small as okay let's take 40 to 1 for example the story behind 40 to 1 was so fascinating to me after I heard the song and then I, I dug into more of it. Like, you know, I, I love that you guys do Sabaton history because that helps a ton and it also gets me more interested in the topic. Like I've spent hours looking up stuff on my own just because I'm so interested. But what we learned about World War II with Poland was basically the way we were taught was Poland just rolled over. Like they, they were no resistance at all to German forces and stuff like that. But then I hear 40 to 1 and I'm like, wait a second. And then I watch the Sabaton history and then I go learn more. And I was like, wow, it's like this is a whole branch of history and events that we just never learned about. And I just I think that's so cool, man, because I've heard other people tell me the same thing. They've learned more about history from your music than they ever learned in school. And I've also <laughs> heard about school teachers that like your band that have used your music to get kids interested in history and yeah. to show them the history. I'm, I'm really happy that they're doing that. But I mean, here's the thing. We can't really teach history in a song. We can be the trailer for a movie. So, yes. you know, get people, oh, what are they singing about? Uh, I mean, maybe that would be the trailer. Sabaton history could be the introduction. But I mean, with these things and any of our songs, people taught themselves. We might just have gotten them, made them aware of the events or yes. ignited the spark, you know. And that's and that's a great thing. I mean, uh, 
Hannes said it very well when I was talking to him. He's like, we never claim to be actual historians. And I was like, no. And I think, you know, people, people understand that, you know, nobody's going to be super upset. I mean, I've seen it from you guys. Like there's a, a couple songs I think that you guys have corrected and said like, Hey, we had a line in the lyrics here that actually maybe should have been this or wasn't entirely accurate. And that's also a good thing to, you know, commend you for though, because there's a lot of people that just wouldn't correct it. They'd be like, yeah, whatever. Yeah. <laughs> yeah well, it's uh, also history is a living well, sort of subject. I mean, and discovery of a, of a new document or uh, an archaeological find in some cases could throw make a song that we wrote you know a decade ago yeah. uh make all the info we had false yeah because it's important to remember and the further we go back into history the less documented the events were and if, especially if you go back only 150 200 years at that point, the average soldier couldn't even read or write. Yeah. So I all mean, we get is the commander's version, and they want to look good. <laughs> yeah, oh, exactly. I mean, and that is a very important thing for a lot of people to remember is, you know, history is basically written by people that won and people that are in charge. So you may not get the entire story from somebody, but there are probably songs that you couldn't have written uh, 15, 20 years ago either. I mean, Soldier of Heaven is... Um, Obviously, while that story is documented, in the last 10 years, there have been new discoveries made, you know. As yeah, and they, they discovered some barracks, I think it was November, December last year. Yeah. Know, there. So it's like, that's really cool, too, that, you know, like you said, as time goes on, you can, you know, find out new things and stuff like that. And it's really Absolutely. cool. And it's um, dangerous to uh, dangerous territory, though, because sometimes you're. Um, you're always looking at any large event, you're going to have conflicting sources. You know, let's say we're talking about World War II, Russia versus Germany, reports on casualties, everything, you know, how many miles or kilometers mm -hmm. were, were the troops moving that day. So that's where it's important to distinguish us as, you know, passionate amateurs from the proper experts professionals yeah. is that we have to lean on the professionals and their knowledge uh, because we had to read the professionals book and the analysis we can't uh, make that judgment ourselves and especially when it comes to how many people died and uh, or whatever it is we're gonna have to go on the well historical consensus among most uh, the the smarter people yeah. <laughs> saying well, we're probably thinking here and here. These guys say it's over there. No, not possible. Should be in this range. So um, in many, many cases, uh, that's the thing we run into on a daily basis where people claim that, oh, this is wrong. It happened on that day or it was that many people involved. Oh, well, depending on your sources, uh, we're pretty careful. But, you know, we do mistakes, but we're pretty, care pretty careful with those things, not to make any too specific claims. Yeah, I've I've gotten very used to, especially doing YouTube videos. Um, I have gotten, I've become very aware of my wording because when I do the pop up facts in my reaction videos, I actually do spend time looking stuff up. A lot of people, I think, assume I've had people that are like, "Oh, you just go on Wikipedia." I was like, "No, I I do use Wikipedia as a starting point just to look exactly. at things," but. The, the good thing about Wikipedia that I don't think a lot of people do is that those articles do have references. So you can yeah. go to those references and read those and then you can find something else. And you're right. A lot of things that you find have conflicting answers, but you notice that the wording that a lot of them use is they use the word approximations a lot and estimated guesses and stuff like that. So even when you look at something like um, Soldier of Heaven, when I did that reaction video, I was trying to put some facts about the actual events in there and everything I found had different numbers. So yeah. depending on what your source was, the casualty numbers were different. Um, when some of those landslides and avalanches took place were different. So I've also gotten used to in my videos using those words. It's like, you know, the estimates are this, or the approximation is this. And even if I'm just doing a gear video and I'm not 100% sure on somebody's instrument now, it's like, 
my best guess is I think this is what they're using, but I'll double check, you know, and there's still people that are very um, opinionated and also people that thought that they had learned something one way when they find out it's something different. Sometimes people get very defensive about things yeah. rather than um, being open to it, possibly being different than what they thought it was. So, you know, I run into that a lot on YouTube. If I say one thing and somebody thinks that it's different, I get I sometimes get some very aggressive comments where people Yeah, I think it's a very dangerous uh, worldview there. I mean, as I don't know why it's seen as a weakness to change your mind. I think it's mm -hmm. a strength. It should be mm -hmm. exactly the opposite. Uh, and I I have no shame whatsoever when it comes and I've been stating something that I thought I was sure of because I read it in this history book and then it turns out I was wrong and why would I yeah I can be ashamed if I went on a little bit too strong about it yeah <laughs> or went were a bit too cocky but there is nothing wrong in saying oh shit I'm so sorry you mm -hmm. know I was totally wrong and then move, learn from that and move on uh I think that's a way more healthy way of of doing it and I I, I don't see the advantage of not yeah. doing it like that. I, I totally agree with you. And I get it. And, you know, I've been guilty of it. There are times where, you know, you feel very strongly about something and it may take you a little longer. And I think, I don't know if it, it's just like how we are wired as humans, but there there is something, I, I guess, embarrassing is the good word about admitting you're wrong and changing your mind about something. But when you think about it, maybe that embarrassment lasts for like a little bit, but nobody really cares. Like nobody's really going to care that you admitted you were no. wrong. We think about these things and think about the perceptions of ourself way more than anybody else thinks about us. Like, and oh, it's yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, it's important to remember also, I mean, people, I think people mix up opinions and facts somehow. Yeah. Especially um, now. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really weird how, yeah, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but they're not entitled to their own facts because facts are facts. Yeah. And those facts are the ones you'll use in, to base your opinion on. And uh, sometimes people are so, so attached to their opinion that accepting that that fact was wrong is going to have to force them to reevaluate their opinion. And I think that's where the problem comes in. Yeah, for sure. I totally agree with that. And, you know, I've seen some, you know, we'll talk about opinions. I've seen, um, I know you guys have dealt with this for a long time and it still blows my mind because anybody that takes a little bit of time to listen to your music can see that this is not the case, but there are people that claim that you guys are glorifying war. I've seen extreme comments where people say that you guys are like Nazi sympathizers and stuff. And it's like, come on, like you can listen to this stuff and, and, and immediately know that that's not the case. You know, I, well, I find it especially hilarious because my mother is from the Czech Republic. So mm -hmm. being of Slavic descent, that would mean I would consider my mom subhuman, untermenschen, according to Nazi yeah. ideology, which, yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I don't, I think it's a shame that it's happening from a professional standpoint, because I think that would, people having those ideas could stop them from maybe listening to our music, booking a show with us or such. But on a personal level, I sort of find it funny. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And there's there's a, there's a lot of things like that um, with lots of different music. People like to come up with excuses of why they don't want to get into something. And I've I've 100 percent been guilty of this in the past. Like starting this YouTube channel, as much as I've always been into music and I've worked in music since I was 18 years old, there are certain scenarios where I realized I've been making excuses for like writing off a band or not giving them time or something like that. Um, baby metal is a good example of that. I will fully admit the first time somebody showed me baby metal, I was on tour and it was one of our older monitor engineers. He's like, Have you ever seen this? And he showed me one of their first music videos. And I'm like, okay. Like, I was like, this is, this is a gimmick. Like this is a, this is a, this is an absolute gimmick. This is the same thing as like, you know, boy bands that were assembled in the U S somebody created this just to make money. And I held on to that opinion for a very long time. And it wasn't until 
I started doing reactions where I was open about that. I told people, I was like, I don't listen to baby metal. It's a gimmick. And people were like, give it a chance. Like, <laughs> like just sit down and give it a chance. And I was like, okay. And I did a couple of reactions to their songs and I totally admitted defeat on that. I was like, this is actually really awesome. I was like, not only, not only is it super entertaining and their live shows are really over the top and great, the band is fantastic. Yeah. Like I, I thoroughly enjoyed like listening to their music now where 10 years ago, I, I completely wrote them off just because of what I thought about them. Um, Nightwish is another example. I didn't listen to Nightwish for the first time until like right when I started this channel because somebody had told me that Nightwish is just basically another version of Evanescence. And I don't necessarily like Evanescence's music that much. So I never wanted to listen to Nightwish. And it's funny, I look back at it now and it's like, why did I form that opinion? Because somebody else told me. Yeah. I formed my opinion based off somebody else's opinion with no... Who I guess wasn't very informed comparing Evanescence and Nightwish. <laughs> exactly. And that's, and I think I say all that to, to, to really just bring up the point that I think when we talk about facts and opinions, a lot of people are forming their opinions solely based off the things that they hear from others. And sometimes mm -hmm. they don't realize that what that other person is telling them is also just their opinion that they formed. Yeah, exactly. So. The people posing opinions as facts, that's really dangerous, you know? Mm -hmm. But I mean, when, when it comes to listening music, I guess we're all guilty, guilty of that. I've had that, and I guess you have as well, but it's important to bring up, I think, um, Touring, you know, uh, sitting in a tour bus, somebody's showing you, have you, you heard about that band? No, I totally missed that. You know, and you're sitting in with another band or with your band and crew and somebody's playing you something. And I've had that happen to me. And I've had that happen to others when I was playing the music. Like, if you, you know this one and they're like listening to it for a while, they're like, ah, not my thing. And then half a year later, you play it again and they love it or they come back to you Hey, have you heard this? Yeah, I fucking played it to you half a year ago. <laughs> you told me it sucked, you know, yeah, <laughs> or it wasn't your yeah. thing. And uh, that's really interesting. It really shows how you have to be in the right mindset, sort of, mm -hmm. to be open to new music. Are you tired? And it also goes for going to a heavy metal show. Uh, if you're standing in the line outside, freezing your ass off your girlfriend or boyfriend just broke up with you five minutes ago the beer tastes like shit and it's warm um yeah even if the band is great you're not gonna have fond memories of that day you know absolutely and you know that's one thing i love talking about with music man is you can it's such an emotional thing that there i when people ask me what my favorite bands are i could give them a list of 20 bands because it's so hard to pick when um one of the more of the most difficult things i did on my channel so far was last year everybody's like hey give us a top 10 list of your favorite albums of 2021 i was like this is so <laughs> difficult because first of all i bought like 60 or 70 albums last year and all of those albums have a special place for me depending on what kind of mood i'm in like there are certain bands i like listening to at certain times and in different moods and it's so hard to pick favorites. And it's funny that you brought up about the the sharing music with people because that happens on tour so much and I loved it. And you get so many different people in your crews. Like the last five years before the pandemic, I was working for a country artist in Nashville and I am not a country fan at all. Like I, I like rock and metal and I, I like all genres of music. If it's something that makes me happy and feel good when I listen to it, I'll just listen to it. So yep. there are some things in country I found that I could enjoy, but the cruise and country music right now are so wild because all of the metal heads and all of the guys that were working warp tour are coming to work for country bands now. So, <laughs> so our crew, for example, um, our production manager at one point, like I said, he had worked with, apocalyptica and um he used to do uh pa stuff for like metallica and stuff like that and then our monitor engineer used to do monitors for like cannibal corpse and dying fetus and stuff <laughs> and then like so everybody in our crew is all over the place and we'd all share music with each other and i was always kind of 
I, I kind of felt like um, like a circus performer, or not a circus performer, but like, you know, one of the oddities at a circus because every day when I set up my guitar world, I turn on metal. That's my background music of choice when I'm... Sorry, I don't know if you can hear my yeah. daughter going nuts <laughs> right now. Um, metal is my background music of choice when I'm working on guitars. And I would always get other country crews or people in the bands walking by and you'd see them just looking at me all weird. And we had one band that we toured with that um, one of the band members came up to me. She was a very, very sweet woman, but she's like, are you all right? And I was like, yeah, why? She's like, well, you're always listening to such angry music. And I'm just like, this is almost sweet. <laughs> I was, it, it was, but I was like, listen, I'm like, she's just, you know, she grew up in the South in the U S and she's just a really sweetheart. And I was like, metal isn't angry. I know a lot of people hear metal and they just assume that it, like it's anger and pissed off lyrics and stuff. But like, for example, if you listen to a band like Hatebreed, like East Coast hardcore band, some of their lyrics are some of the most positive things I've ever heard in my life. All their <laughs> lyrics are about pushing through things and perseverance and overcoming obstacles and strength. And it's like, that's that's very common in the hardcore world. And it's just so funny to me that people that aren't into rock and metal just immediately assume it's angry. It's uh, people, the people that listen to metal are just angry or they're, or they're violent people or they're not nice people. And it's, it's so funny when I met people on tour that knew I was a metalhead and they're like, yeah, you're really nice. Like you're a lot different than we thought you'd be. <laughs> so, yeah, we've had that a couple of times as well. Oh, but you're on stage and when you're singing, you sound like this and this, and then we actually meet you and you're actually relaxed and kind of nice. Like what, what in the hell did you expect? Yeah. I'm going to come into an interview like an angry drill sergeant screaming at people, you know? <laughs> yeah, like, what is it about me, other than you hearing the music I was listening to, that gave you that impression? Like, what makes you think I was just going to be a mean person to everybody? Now, you can make the argument with me, like, I'm covered in tattoos and the beard and stuff like that, you know? So there is a little stereotyping there, but... Um, yeah, man, there, it, it, it's just great. The music discovery on the road with all the different personalities and stuff out there. And, you know, it, it is funny too, when I've discovered stuff on YouTube, I have had that exact situation that you brought up where I text a friend and I'm like, dude, I just filmed a reaction to this band. Have you heard these guys? And he goes, yeah, I showed them to you like two years ago. And I was like, oh, <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> I don't remember. Well, you weren't in the mood. You weren't, you know, exactly as you said, mood is everything. If I'm barbecuing and drinking beer with friends, there's a, something I will put on. Mm -hmm. But if I'm having an hour for myself, putting on nice headphones and I'm going to listen to some music, it's not going to be the same. <laughs> nope, not at all. And there, I've, I have learned through all this that there, there is a big difference between actively listening to something or just hearing something. So when I, when I first started doing YouTube stuff, one of my big things, and I I've changed my opinion on this a lot. I used to kind of be like, I, I would watch other reactors and I'd be like, these people are so full of shit. There's no way that they've never heard enter Sandman by Metallica. Like there's no chance. <laughs> and here's a good example of that. And you just recently did an interview with Elizabeth from the charismatic voice. And just for the record, like I, I know her and her husband very well. I would consider them friends. Like I love those people. So when I first saw her put a reaction up to Metallica and she said it was her first time ever listening to Metallica, <laughs> I messaged her husband immediately. And I was like, dude, come on. Like there's <laughs> no way that Elizabeth has never heard Metallica. And the way that he put it was exactly, you know, the point I'm making is like, she's probably heard Metallica. She's probably heard it on a, on a commercial or at a sporting event or something like that, but she's definitely never sat down and actually fully paid attention to Metallica. And considering her background with music and her upbringing and stuff like that, I was like, yeah, I, I believe that. I really do. And, you know, the same thing when I first listened to you guys, Nightwish, Blind Guardian, there's a lot of European metal bands that unless you have specific friends in the U.S. that introduced them to you, you may not have heard of them before. So I had a lot of people that told me when I first listened to you guys and Nightwish and stuff, they're like, you're full of shit. There's no way that you're, you're into metal and you've never heard this band. And I was like, well, it's just where I'm located. 
Yeah, and what you're doing, I mean, the same thing for me, probably one of the biggest artists in the world at the moment, Ed Sheeran. I don't know any song of him. I could I read about him all the time. And if somebody would play me like two or three songs, I would probably say, oh, yeah, I probably heard. I, I recognize that from the shopping mall or from the radio or whatever. Yes. You know? Yeah. And there's there's to go off that, too. Uh, I agree. Ed Sheeran is a massively huge artist. And I could I don't think I could name you the songs, but I know there's two two songs for sure by him that if I heard right now, I'd be like, oh, that's Ed Sheeran, because I've heard them a lot. They've been played okay. everywhere. But there are other artists, too, um, examples like that. There's been a couple times I've done reactions and stuff where I, I get to the chorus and I'm like, you know what? I have heard this somewhere before. Yeah. And But there are also artists to me that have transcended pop culture so much that it's almost hard not to know like who they are. Um, you know, when I see reactors that do uh, first time ever hearing Bohemian Rhapsody, that one, no matter what, I don't, I don't believe that one. Like, I mean, no. that's, that's a specific example of a song that has transcended pop culture so much that it's, it's almost impossible that you haven't heard it. It's like, you know, yeah, you can't do that with the, those huge ones. I guess Michael Jackson, I was going to say Jean thriller or something like that. Yeah. yeah. Like, how are you going to say, I, I never heard this, you know, it's just so big. It's, it's almost, it's almost unavoidable. You'd almost have to be actively avoiding it to not hear it ever. Yeah. Cause I mean, but it's really interesting now though, is what is common knowledge to anyone. I would say above 30, you have younger people these days that have heard of Elvis Presley, but never heard a song. That's a great point. Imagine. Yeah. Imagine how, what kind of musical discovery they could do, you know? And I mean, a lot of pe people have been talking about the Beatles and they come up in, in conversations all the time. And when I was growing up, they were still playing them a lot, you know, at my friend's dad or whatever, or they were played on the radio. These days, I don't hear much of the Beatles at all. You know, that, That's a really good point. I actually, when I was growing up too, I, I heard the Beatles like, in a lot of places, definitely on the radio and stuff like that. It has been a long time since I've randomly heard a Beatles song somewhere. That's a really good point. I mean, so imagine how much of that, that is impossible for an, especially look at a 55 year old. Mm -hmm. You tell them that this 25 year old have, have never heard the Beatles. They're never going to believe it. You know? Yeah. I mean, and a lot of the music that I heard growing up was thanks to my dad because um, he's very into music and I grew up on a lot of classic rock. I mean, I grew up knowing who, you know, the Beatles, the Rolling Stones, Led Zeppelin, Pink Floyd, Deep Purple, like that's stuff I grew up on. Um, so when I hear somebody that is close to my age or a little younger, that's like, yeah, I've, I've heard of the Rolling Stones, but I don't think I've ever heard any of their music. I was like, what? <laughs> it's like, How is this possible? Yeah, yeah. But there are, um, in country music, um, there are a lot of the younger generation of country fans that, I mean, I would argue Johnny Cash is probably one of the biggest names in country music ever. And there are definitely people that they know the name because it's everywhere. It's so such a big name. And there's probably people that own Johnny Cash t-shirts because to them it's country. But they may not be able to name you a Johnny Cash song, to be honest. It's one of the few country artists I've listened to quite a lot, actually. <laughs> yeah, I dude, I love Johnny Cash. And, you know, I listened... The country that I actually like is kind of, you know... I, it would, would be considered traditional country at this point. Because country in the U.S. right now is very pop-driven. I mean, it's yeah. it's way different. Um, and, and country over here, I don't know if you know, is I, I talked about this with Karan from Bloodywood on the last podcast. Country is massive here. I mean, oh, I know. It's, I don't know anything about it, but I know it's massive. <laughs> it's it, 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 it's ridiculous. It's it's huge. Um, you know, a mid level country artist in the U.S. is probably bigger than like, you know a really at the top of the list, like metal band in some cases, it's crazy how big they are here. Um, yeah, so mid-level, mid-level, uh, counter band is bigger than Rammstein. <laughs> well, that's, that would be hard to do, <laughs> but here, 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 here's a good example. Um, Papa Roach, 
They've been Mm -hmm. around since the late 90s. They're a big name in the rock and metal community in the U.S. And they would be considered at this point one of those like top tier legacy, you know, metal and rock acts. Um, But even at the top of their game, they were doing like I saw them in 2005 in Chicago and they were doing um, the Congress Theater and, you know, a few thousand people. Uh, when I started working for the guy that I was working for, for the last five years, his name's Dustin Lynch. He's his first, his first album came out in like 2012. I started with him right when his second album came out. And that first tour I did with him at the time, he was considered a low level, like intro country artist. We were already in two buses and trailers and doing like 1500 to 2000 cap rooms every night. And that's a low level country artist. (laughs) Like it's crazy, man. And it's the same with pop. It's like pop and country are the two biggest genres in the U S. Um, but I, I, we brought up my dad and we brought up live touring and stuff. And I wanted to bring this up a couple days ago before we're filming this, you guys just announced a big U S and Canada tour. And I've got to be, I would bet money right now. That's absolutely going to happen as of now, because, you know, with COVID restrictions here, touring has been going on for like a year now. Like yeah. nobody's really canceling anything. I mean, you guys were just over here. Unfortunately, yep. that tour got cut short. I was actually going to go see the show in Nashville and then it got cut <laughs> short. But you guys are playing in Nashville on my dad's birthday. Oh, and really? I, and I've already told my dad, I was like, you got to come into town. And he's like, done. So I'm going to take my dad to go see you guys. It'll be both of our first time seeing you guys uh, on his birthday. Oh, cool. So yeah, that'll be bring fun. him in. <laughs> yeah, that'll be, that'll be fun. now the interesting thing about the, the Nashville show is it's at the Ryman auditorium. Do you know anything about that place? Nope. Oh, this I'll is say the Nashville ones. I think uh, oh, like back in the day. this is going to be great. The Ryman auditorium is right downtown. I mean, you're on Broadway in Nashville. It is known as the mother church of country music. It is one of the oldest venues in Nashville. It's where the original Grand Old Opry took place. So you're talking, it was made famous by artists like Johnny Cash and Dolly Parton and stuff. Oh. It is known as a country venue. Um, <laughs> when I saw that it was at the Ryman, I was like, what? That's almost blasphemy then, you know, having well, a metal. They, they've been having a lot of, uh, Tremonti and Seven Dust just played there recently. So they're bringing okay. in, they're bringing in metal acts. But the reason I'm surprised is because it's, it's an old church building that they turned into a venue. There's no floor in terms of like pit area. It's, it's all seating, but it's pews. It's literally oh, really? church pews. Yeah. <laughs> It's dude. It, it, I mean, it's a legendary venue. The fact that you guys are playing there is is worth mentioning. Um, but man, I the, the first time I ever brought my wife to a show there, I did a show there. The first time I ever did a show there was in 2012. Um, I was touring with Pat Benatar and we did a show at the Ryman. My wife grew up on country music. She grew up in the South and she knows the history and stuff like that. So the first time I walked her into the Ryman, I walk her, um, she's walking with me and I start walking across the stage to go over to the dressing rooms and I don't hear her footsteps and I stop and I turn and she's like stopped on the side of the stage and I was like, what are you doing? She's like, can I walk across the stage? And I was like, (laughs) yeah, it's a stage. And she's like, but it's the Ryman. And I was like... That's that's how legendary this place is. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, I'm, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> dude, I'm excited about it, man. And it's cool because for you guys, I didn't look at your scheduling, but if you have a, a day off the next day or a night off or something, I mean, you can walk out that venue when you're done and you're on Broadway. I mean, if you guys want to go bar hop and listen to some live music, I mean, you're in the right spot. Yeah, I was I was scared last time I was there. I was I think after a show we played, so it was pretty late, but there were still some places open. And the level of the local musicians in bars, insane. It's insane. That is, you know, in in many other places around the world, they'd be, you know, uh, sort of 
considered gods, but here they're <laughs> just, you know, playing in a bar, supporting some singer they never, you know, nobody's ever heard of, or yeah. at least I had never heard of. And there's not that many people there. And you're sitting there having a beer, just thinking, yeah, it's live music. So what? But after, before even getting your beer, when you order, you're looking around. What the f- <laughs> that drummer really can groove. Yeah. Oh, shit, that bass player is really in the pocket. What what's going on here, you know? Yeah. And we're not used to that level of musicianship going into a Irish pub in Europe, you know? Yeah. And it a lot of the musicians that you see on Broadway in Nashville are people that move to Nashville from other parts of the country hoping to make it. And and I think a lot of people's perception of making it in music is like getting signed or in the case of some of these musicians on Broadway, getting a gig with a signed country artist because yeah. country um, is, is also one of those like pop and stuff like that, where it's basically all about the person whose name is on the marquee. It's not a band. Yeah. It's one person and they hire a, a backing band. And a lot of the musicians, even for these big signed artists in country, they actually play on Broadway, like when they're home during the week. So um, my, uh, let's see, Dustin's drummer and his drum tech on that tour, when we were home during the week, both had gigs where they would play with local artists on Broadway just for fun. And it doesn't matter what bar you walk into and there's like 50 bars downtown in a row now every musician in there is going to be good. Like I the first time I moved to Nashville, I considered myself a pretty decent bass player. And the first time I walked into a bar on Nashville, I was like, I, I, I could never compete with this skill level. This is ridiculous. <laughs> like It's almost, it's the, the level of musicianship I saw there is so good. It must all, almost be sort of an inflation in great musicianship in that mm -hmm. city. Yeah. Yeah. And it's, and it's, it's just wild because the competition to get gigs here is crazy. I mean, this this town is so music driven. And I mean, anybody you meet in this town plays something because, like I said, a lot of people move here because they want to make it in music. And the amount of people, I mean, the bars downtown are so overbooked that uh, one of the bars here, um, it's an old legendary venue called Tootsie's. They have a second location in the airport here and they're so overbooked with musicians that sometimes like if somebody's trying to get their foot in the door at the place on Broadway, they're like, yeah, we're going to have you play at our airport location for like a year first <laughs> before we can even get you in here. And people Ooh. do it like wow. it's crazy, <laughs> you know, so but I'm excited, man, because, you know, not only have I never seen you guys live and I'm looking forward to it, but to, to share that experience with my dad too, because I grew up going to concerts with him and we haven't been able to go to one in a while. And, um, you know, with the new album coming out, which by the way is fancy. I mean, I don't know if you can see it. I already have it on my wall, but <laughs> oh, um, yeah. it's dude, it Thanks. is. Oh yeah. It's fantastic. And I think I saw a quote from you that I think really said it perfectly. I don't know if this is exactly what you said, but you said something along the lines of this new album is like the, the different side of the same coin in terms of Sabaton. And that's a great way of putting it because while it maintains that overall sound that I'm used to with you guys, there are some different moments in there. I was listening to that record for the first time in the car with my wife. And there were some songs where I was like, this sounds familiar yet new and different at the same time. Like, it's just great. And I just wanted to talk to you about that for a while because Hannes gave me his perception on recording the album and, you know, doing everything with uh, Jonas and stuff like that. Um, when did you guys start working on this record in terms of in the studio? In the studio, like, I don't know, when the, when the New Year's holiday was over, second, third, fourth of the... Whichever was the Monday after <laughs> oh, okay. New Year's 21, you know? Okay. And uh, we're pretty fast in that. I mean, Hannes is a, you know, people don't realize in many cases because Sabaton's music doesn't allow uh, maybe always all musicians to show what they really, really are their max capacity. I mean, Hannes is a 
fantastic drummer and you, you can hear it on his grooves but you have to be another drummer to realize how good or you know yeah. into music or a musician to realize how good he is and so i mean when he puts down an album we start and Jonas is fantastic with the sounds i mean we are ready to record if they roll in the drum kit in the morning we're starting recording after lunch nice you know and uh, by wednesday or possibly thursday that's it we're done Wow. I mean, so, it's, <laughs> you, you bring up a really good point to, um, uh, with the drums, I should say, not well, yeah, the whole, uh, but, you know. but, but even, yeah, yeah. With the drums, but you bring up a really good point where, you know, only other musicians sometimes can, can hear exactly like the, the talent level of another person. And I've always tried to tell people that a good musician knows exactly what to play for what they're playing. They don't necessarily exactly. need to go over the top. Like, um, Per is a perfect example of that for me. There are some things on some songs where it's it's very simple. It's very simple, pre precise bass lines. Like um, Ghost Division, for example. The intro of that song and the heavy parts is literally him just playing like quarter notes on the bass. Yep. And, then, and then I try and imagine that with anything but that. Like if he was actually following along with the rhythm of something else, it would sound completely different. And I think with um, YouTube and technology and people being able to see other musicians, there's this false, um, I'm trying to think of the word I'm thinking of. Well, I guess there's this false narrative now of, especially with YouTube musicians, people are now conditioned to, the, to think that a musician is only good if they're able to just completely shred their face off. You know, we've got a lot of... Uh, and with a, with a take that they uh, pre-recorded, uh, you know, during eight hours before. Exactly. And then they're just playing along to it, you know. Like, and... there's one of the biggest uh, bass players on YouTube is this Italian guy named Davey504. And his talent oh, skill... Yeah. yeah, his talent skill is unreal. Like, it's unquestionable. He's so good. But a lot of the stuff he does, he's just constantly shredding slap bass parts. And he has this joke where he makes fun of bass players that play with a pick and stuff like that. But there's some people that don't get that humor. So when I do a bass playthrough of something that requires a pick because you can't play at that speed or if it's a tone you're going for, people will be like, oh, you're using a you're using a pick? Pff, bass players shouldn't be using picks. I was like, well, who's, who, who says? He's like, well, that's what Davey 504 says. I was like, no. A good musician will use and do whatever they feel is necessary to do a good part on a song. And get the right sound. You get a totally different sound with a pick. And if you're playing a playthrough of a bass player who used a pick on that, exactly. you're going to get closer to the sound by using that pick. Exactly. But I mean, not, not slapping uh, uh, Davey here, but I mean, that channel is great. But I, I watch it for entertainment value. For sure. Yeah. There are... There but are <laughs> nothing but, else exactly and it's like that's what people that watch these videos need to realize and um dean from archspire talked about this recently too he goes don't don't be fooled like listen he goes all these youtube musicians are are good musicians you can tell if somebody's good or not yeah. but what you're seeing was specifically made and edited for that reason you're going to get a completely different outcome if you sit somebody down on a live stream and have them do a playthrough, then if they actually record the audio separate and then play over it and stuff like that, what you're seeing is a polished, finished product of a musician that has edited almost in the same way they would edit in the studio. You're not actually seeing them sitting there and playing it. Want to see a good musician, go see a band who had a stressful changeover at a festival. They can <laughs> yeah. barely hear what they're doing, but yeah. they're still killing it on stage and grooving. Oh, That's dude, good, you know, I, we've had so many situations on the road where, um, those are, those are some of like, as a roadie, those are some of my shining moments. It's like, okay, the band that played before us just went seven minutes over and we're supposed to have a 15 minute changeover. We have eight minutes now to change over an entire set of backline and get everything ready and go. Dude, there have been festivals where I have literally finished line checking like as the intro for the set is rolling and I run off the stage as fast as I can and just hand the guitar to our guitar player. Yeah. And, it never and, hits the rack, you know, it's just yeah. And then it's like, and then in the first, like the first 30 seconds of the song, you're just like, 
please everything work and then everything works and it's like okay cool it's like those are those are the crazy situations that i think when when people go see live music um the normal concert goer you know all, all they paid money to a show they just want to go see a good show and that's what they should expect but the things that some of the bands and crews have to go through to make sure that that's a good show, that's the stuff they should be making movies about because that's some oh, yeah, stressful stuff. Oh, yeah, I agree. Stuff. I totally agree. Yeah, like yeah. those are some stressful moments, man. Um, the amount of work that goes into putting on a full show. I mean, in a lot of sense, you know, the musicians get a lot of the credit while... Uh, well, in many cases, yeah, well deserved, uh, yeah. and I'm not saying they shouldn't, but I, I also think that the crew should certainly not be forgotten in that case, because in many, many cases, uh, some of these people have been working, you know, since early in the morning with only a few hours of sleep, and they have to stay super sharp and yeah. hear the tiniest thing, like, oh, wait, is there a change in pitch in the in the snare drum? Is the snare drum skin about to break go get get the you know have the new snare drum in your hand even before the skin yep. broke or something and getting it on during a song between i don't know 10 seconds and moving the mic getting everything back in place yeah. that's the, what impresses me the most when i see shows and it's actually. in and i think uh most most roadies and musicians like we kind of know our role on the road like i'm fully aware as a roadie that the people that are there are there to see the band and the artist like they're the ones putting on the show that's what's going on i actually really like being in that support role i, I like to be able to say like i'm the one that you know helped put this show on even if i'm not the one on stage that people see and stuff like that because the simplest way that i always put it uh for people that ask like what i do on the road it's like my whole job is to make sure that everything gear wise and stage wise is taken care of to the point where the person that's playing doesn't have to worry about anything other than walking on stage and putting on a good show. Like that's how it works. It's like a symbiotic relationship. It's like we work all day during the day so that the artist can go on stage and put on a killer show for the people that are there. Yeah, and it's a really important safety net because I know back in the day how stressful it is to have to think about these other things, doing multiple roles, being, uh, okay, if a guitar breaks, what happens then? Where is my spare guitar if a string goes? Also thinking of, uh, oh, shit, yeah, maybe being the one triggering intros and outros from stage, trying to remember all of these things. It is way, way easier to do a good show for the crowd if that all of those worries have been eliminated and that's that's that brings up a great point because i see a lot of people that i wouldn't say a lot of people but i've seen the argument from people that they try and want to knock down bands like big bands and they're like oh they're like they got this rock star mentality they have somebody that takes care of their own guitars um there was somebody recently i can't remember who it was i think it was ian anderson from jethro toll don't quote me on that, but I think it is. Okay. He was on an interview and he said that uh, musicians and artists that have their own techs and roadies are divas and rock stars and was like, like, I work on my own stuff. I don't need somebody else to do it and blah, blah, blah. And I was like, cool. That's, that's, if you want to set up your own gear all day and work on your own stuff, cool. But that's what people don't understand is that the, for the people that say that musicians that are like at the size that you guys are, are like, oh, these guys are rock stars. They have to have their own techs and their own assistants and stuff like that. I was like, yeah, but what you're not seeing right now is the years and years that they did all of that stuff themselves before they got to the level that they're at now. And having those roadies now does exactly what you just said. It eliminates the pressure from from you guys so all you have to do is put on that good show like could you imagine yeah, could you imagine also... well sorry could, no i was gonna say could you imagine like you guys right now like all of you guys you guys as musicians would have to like work on all of your own gear all day and restring your own guitars all day and then be like crunched for time and then have to go on stage and perform it would be stressful it's insanely stressful because yeah. we have uh, been forced to do it a few times uh in recent years and it is brutal 
not because we are incapable of doing it, but the strain, because at, uh, on a show day, there might also be a meet and greet. There might also be interviews to be done, uh, both phoners and face-to-face. -face. And trying to set that up then, I'm trying to, let's say somebody's just trying to build their drums, speaking to the journalist and not having a tour manager who can go out and meet them. And then that person has to go through and then there's fans there who wants to take a picture and a selfie and there's nothing wrong with that but at that point you need to get this interview going yeah. all of these things clashing it is a brutal environment uh and it is fun uh and i we have done done those years going directly from stage to the merch booth you know <laughs> yeah and this is uh, and and even doing something like this right now us filming this podcast episode like this for for anybody that's listening that doesn't know like this is also media for the band. This isn't something that we just set up just to do when we had some free time. Like this has been scheduled for when it worked on your schedule with the other media stuff you have to do. And that's pretty much what happens with almost every interview you see with the band. There is a PR person that's making sure that the schedule is going to be okay. The time limit has to be okay. And, you know, there's a really good example of, uh, one of the first interviews I ever did on my channel was with um, Tatiana and Eugene from Ginger. And it was one of those days where they were scheduled for like eight hours of media. And I only had, you know, like a, a half hour time frame with them. And they were so on the ball with it that like, I was getting close to wrapping up the interview, but before I even could, Eugene was just like, dude, I am so sorry but we have to go like we, we have, we have so many interviews and we have to stay on schedule. Otherwise it's going to steamroll into everything else. And I've had that happen to me. I've had yeah. people show up late because another interview went too long. And a lot of the artists, they don't want to, they don't want to have to be the person to sit and stop and say, Hey, we're done. Like, you know, so there's so in many much cases as well. People forget the, the, that aspect and you know if somebody says oh you're not a real band because you're not carrying your own drums or whatever uh, the argument might be uh yeah but when it comes to let's say you're a fan then you want the band to play more than i guess you want to see more shows you yeah. want to have more albums so if we do have and any band has a crew who takes care of things booking interviews which means I can make a lot more interviews. It's not like I'm gonna do the same amount. My I, I only have my only limitation here is time and energy. So yeah. I'm gonna spend the same amount of time and energy doing media. Should I do five or fifty interviews? Should I be bothering to count all this? When uh, well, if we weren't to have a crew, how many people would not have a job? Yeah. When we, when we rolled out on uh, the previous European great great tour, the, the tour for the Great War, uh, we were with support bands and everything, 120 or 130 people rolling. And there's, you know, yeah. the musicians were a fucking minority there. Yeah, <laughs> that, dude, and I'm, I'm happy you actually gave me that number because when I was doing reactions to uh, the live videos from the great tour, I think it was the specific one that I remember was, um, and leaves to the Krieg, uh, I was like, I started looking at all the production and I talked about it in the video. I was like, okay, just from my background as being a roadie, I'm looking at all the stuff on stage, everything that's going on. I'm like, this has to be over. It's, pro it's probably like seven or eight semis, probably 10 buses of people. I mean, there's got to be over a hundred people on this show. And yep. I'm, I'm, I'm glad I got to hear you say that because, you know, I, I notice those things, man. When I look at live performances, I'm like, there's so many people that are involved with this, what's going on right now. And then yeah. even, and then not even just your live shows, your music videos. When we saw Christmas truce and I saw the, the credits on that and how many people <laughs> were involved, I was like, holy shit. Yeah. Well, that was more of a movie set actually. Because yeah. the, the people who did that, they don't do music videos. They do movies. Yeah. And Thanks to there being a break in production, we were managed to get these. I mean, the special effects guy had worked with Tom Cruise on Mission Impossible stuff, you know. Oh, and, that's uh, crazy. And stuff like that. So and they, but it was the right choice for that because we didn't want it to be a performance video. We wanted the storytelling to be in the center of that. Well, it was. 
But it's, it is thanks to all of these people, we can do several videos and not just one video. Because if we did one video and did it ourselves, we wouldn't have time to do more than one and it would be shit. Mm, yeah. <laughs> and the same with shows. If we didn't have this amount of people helping us, we could only do a tenth of the amount of shows we're doing now. So, yeah. I mean, in a sense, having being able, it's a luxury, I agree, uh, to be able to afford to have a large crew. But that means we are going to put on a larger and better show. That means we can put on more shows. And we are not totally dead when we go off tour. We can make music videos. We can record a new album. So everybody's a fucking winner in that situation. Yeah, absolutely. As far as I'm concerned, you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, now, I talked to Hannes about um, Christmas Truce and Soldier Heaven when he was on mm -hmm. here. But since then, Race to the Sea came out. And oh, yeah. that was really funny because right when that music video dropped, I was getting uh, just people were blowing me up on Twitter and Instagram and Discord. And they're like, you you got to get to this one fast because we need, we want to know what you think about this. And I'm like, OK, that's weird. I don't know. I ever when a new video comes out, I usually get a handful of people that are telling me about stuff. But this was everybody. And I'm like, OK. And right when I started the video and I saw that you guys were in water i'm like okay this is this is what we're going to talk about so i want to i wanted to talk to you about that really quick before we end up wrapping this up because my first thought as you know a tech and a roadie is well the two thoughts i had first of all we know that music videos aren't done in one shot you guys probably took all day to film that which means you were standing in water for hours um and second well well let's well, let's talk about that really quick before i ask my next question how how long did you work on that video and how was the temperature of that water? Uh, actually, it was in the summer in Czech Republic, so it should have been warm, but it wasn't because it was a mine lake. Oh. So, uh, but we had uh, wetsuits under our stage clothes, okay. uh, short sleeve uh, or no sleeved wetsuits, sort of. Uh, so it was not as brutal as it was supposed to be, but that's a cumulative effect sort of when we went in the first time it was dark because we wanted the darkness obviously and we thought ah this is not too bad once you you know your body has warmed up to the water but then you do one or two takes you get positioned you're standing still and then you do another take and then you're out of the water because we had divers with cameras uh recharging the pyros and everything so there were quite a few people uh ready to get into the water as well. And they were not complaining. So we thought, well, these guys are having it tougher than us, but we better not complain, you know? <laughs> so the the explosions in the water that wasn't that wasn't flames and stuff, was that just like air cannons that you guys placed under there? Yep, air cannons uh uh that would of course had to be adjusted adjusted and stuff during that. Yeah. So we had I think like two camera divers and two effect divers. Wow. Uh, well, so there was quite a few. It's the same team who did the Christmas Truce video, actually, but a smaller okay. version of it. Obviously, since we didn't need a lot of extras, basically none. Uh, there goes a whole bunch of people for uh, makeup, support, catering, and everything else, you know. Yeah. So uh, much smaller, but the same uh, director and uh, producers. Oh, very like cool. Um, my, my, next, um, <clears throat> my next thing that I was thinking about purely as a tech was... You know, instruments can take on a little bit of water. You know, I'm sure you guys have, I'm sure you guys have done festivals where it's rained and some instruments have gotten wet, but when you submerge something, that's a completely different story. So the speculation with, you know, me and everybody that was watching the video was, all right, are these replicas that they had made for them? Or are these just instruments that they decided, yeah, we're just going to trash for this video. <laughs> yeah uh well they're not alive and well i'll tell you that uh, they are alive <laughs> but they're not well yeah. um it's actually uh it is real guitars the real guitars we've had on shows but you know with a heavy touring schedule after a couple of hundred shows yeah instruments sort of you either have to totally go into restoration mode or you have to uh sort of go move on and get a new instrument yeah they just get retired yeah, yeah, sort yeah. Of. and these were these were close to retirement because we didn't want to, you know, buy some fake fake shitty instruments and yeah. then uh, you know, so they were 
towards the end of their life cycle anyway. And we figured, yeah, I mean, you should see the nicks and everything. Oh, now. I mean, Even, I was... you know, wood, small wood splinters are coming out. Everything they're, they're fucked. I well, mean, that's what me. I was, that's what I was telling everybody. I was like, you know, there were a couple of people that were like, oh no, you could, you could restore that. I was like, no, no. here's the thing. Like I said, with a little bit of water, you could, you could get away with maybe cleaning stuff up. Cause I've, I've cleaned up instruments that were just rained on, you know, at a festival or something. But when you're submerging wood, especially depending on what type of wood it is, I or mean, hours. yeah, yeah. You were filming for hours and depending on that type of wood, that could be three minutes submerged like that. And that guitar is done. Like you'll yep. never get that wood back into the shape that it was in. It's going to warp. It's not going to sound good. It's going to affect the tone. That's kind of crazy. Cause I, I had no question that they, that they were real guitars. My thought was whether, you know, the companies did replicas just for the video, or if they were guitars that they just didn't mind, you know, damaging. Cause you know, those obviously to everybody that watched were guitars that you see often. I mean, I told some people were like, no, nah, there's no way that like, you know, Chris would take that seven string RGD in the water. I'm like, that is the, okay. if, if that's is. not, if that's not the guitar, that is an exact replica of that RGD seven string that he's used in 10 other music videos we've watched. Yeah. I mean, what this, the thing was, we, we figured this way now that since they were, well, they weren't, broken or bad in any way but they were getting tired so yeah. the the instruments and we thought well why don't we sort of have them as music video guitars from now on i mean even if they're broken from a you know and they're not playable anymore in a real studio or live situation we could still use them as you know uh, guitars for music videos yeah, which means we could ship them off while going and doing another show somewhere. So it's not like we're going to throw them away. But at, at some point as well, when we looked at them now a few weeks ago, I mean, there, if our guitarists would take that and run their hand along, the wood has sort of opened up and split through yep. the lacquer. And, you know, you have they're going to get what they call it splinters in their yeah, hand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're going to have, if we're going to, we're going to, I think we're going to use them as, you know, uh, music video instruments, but we're going to have to sand those, you know, oh, yeah. necks down the instruments down to even make it possible. And yeah, as you said, yeah, there was some warpage on the necks. And yeah. Stuff. And that's, that's, that's a good point too, because, you know, I've also told people, um, what you see in music videos is not necessarily what's ever used in the studio or anything like that, because, you know, half the time instruments aren't even plugged in or anything. So you know, I've, I've done music videos where I've pointed out, I was like, oh yeah, so-and-so is using this. And, um, uh, somebody in the comments will be like, well, that's not what they're endorsed by. I was like, well, I'm aware, but that's <laughs> just what they're using in the video, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and, but you know, it, it was just, it was, those are the things that are in my head when I watch music videos. I'm just like, Oh man. <laughs> like, well, that's was... the only joy we have because a lot of for having worked in music and you played in bands, a lot of the mystery and magic is gone. I mean, yeah. if you hear a certain choir on a album or a sound, you probably could figure out which was the amp, how how was the signal chain. That it's broken down sort of, but it, the mystery of wow that sound came from nowhere. No, you know what synthesizer or what yeah. guitar sort of in the ballpark at least. Um, so our mysteries and what we are looking at is that's our sort of entertainment, figuring out the exact details, uh, what people are doing, how did they achieve that exactly? Because it's, I mean, a Les Paul with a tube screamer and a Marshall isn't going to be a surprise for us, you know? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And it's, it's funny. I, the, the attention to detail that you guys have is so funny too. And Hannes told me such an incredible story about, um, you know, with, with Indy, cause Indy's such a historian about everything. He was like, yeah, during the Christmas truce video, there's a scene where, um, you know, he goes, I get shot and Chris and Tommy like high five each other. And later in the day, Indy was like, Hey, just so you guys know back then, like the high five wasn't even really invented yet. And they wouldn't have been doing that. And he's just like, <laughs> come on. Like, that yeah, the the three videos that we've seen so far from from this album have just been. I mean, I think you guys have established yourselves as 
you know, top of the game when it comes to music videos. I mean, we're talking like, in terms of visuals, it's like you guys and Rammstein are like the two bands that it's just like, when you see one of the, your videos, you just know it's it's going to be over the top. Yeah, we had some time now, actually, to to spend on it. You mean, with the, the whole lockdown thing going on yeah. and not being able to tour because I... To be honest, I really don't like making music videos at all. And it's because we're pretending. Yeah. We did one video once where we sort of, we filmed us playing a song several times live. And we were actually playing it then, but we had, you know, also a click track to the real stuff. But we had a crowd there and that was fun. Then I don't mind doing it. Yeah, sure. We were playing the same song a couple of times. That's to be expected. Yeah. But um, in general, I don't like doing music videos at all, but especially something like Christmas Truce. That's such a big project with stuntmen, uh, everything being filmed. It's, it's a movie set, really. So it becomes kind of okay. But in general, no, it's not my thing. But now we had the time and possibility to do it. So we figured might as well. And with a story like Christmas Truce, it's one of those stories we always thought was one of the best stories in military history. Yeah, uh, We figured we can't cheap out on this one just because of, you know, pandemic reasons so we we figured if there's one video we're gonna do it properly it's gonna be that one <laughs> yeah and and again man that's another piece of history that like i didn't know until listening to your music and since then i've watched so much stuff about it and i was like this is these are the kind of stories that you'd think would be taught everywhere that everybody would want to hear like that humanity in that moment but no that was the first time i'd ever heard that story oh shit i had no idea yeah in, in europe that's something i think is in any school no, i mean the people either. who might say uh, uh, they don't know it but they were probably weren't paying attention history class <laughs> but i yeah. think i think you'd you'd be hard pressed to find any nation who's not teaching that in school at a young age in europe not here i mean history was always one of my favorite subjects and and in terms of history here uh the big things that we're taught are the american revolution the mm -hmm. American Civil War, and then when we got involved with, and we being the U.S., when the U.S. entered into World War One and World War II, those are the big key moments we're taught about, and not a lot else. I mean, you well, I guess Korea and Vietnam and those as well. They don't teach us about that. Oh, okay. <laughs> no, they like, dude, and that's what's crazy about how history changes over time. It literally they change what we're taught because the things about and my dad even told me that he goes they're not going to teach kids about vietnam that was a nightmare for the us they don't want kids learning about that like and it's a good point like here's here's a here's an even weirder point um when i was in school when we learned about world war 2 they taught they talked about the us's use of nuclear weapons against japan and taught us that we had used that bomb on two different cities and then, so I learned that in high school. Actually, I think we learned that in middle school. And then my sister, who's about eight years younger than me, I was helping her study for a test when she was in high school. And um, the question in her book was, name the city that the U.S. used a nuclear bomb on in World War II. And she's like, Hiroshima. And I was like, what about the other one? She's like, what other one? So they didn't teach about the Nagasaki bomb. No, it oh, wasn't wow. even it wasn't even in her history book in school it blew oh, my that's, mind that's, it, i'm it's, sorry i i find that scary <laughs> it is <You> know? <laughs> it's terrifying it's terrifying how people can change and erase things that have happened like i i told her about um the nagasaki one and she asked her teacher about it and she said why didn't you teach us about the second one She's like, because that it wasn't what was in our curriculum. Like, it wasn't what was in the book to teach us. She goes, "I'm just teaching what's in the book." And I'm like, "Man, that's um, that's a little <laughs> that's a little scary there." Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. you know. So, and that's that's again, that's the point of you know history just going the way it is. So, I only have a couple more minutes with you before we got to stay on our schedule, and I wanted to ask you one really quick thing. I promised a friend I would ask this. Okay. <laughs> I've made a lot of friends from around the world since I've done YouTube. A lot in Europe. And one of my Dutch friends um, was like, I need to know why when they play in Netherlands, they end up naked while they're playing. <laughs> and I've, <laughs> I've, kind of, I've kind of heard somebody bring up this story, but I don't know the background to it. 
Uh, yeah, I don't know when that started. Uh, it's probably a bunch of years ago, uh, but they had this thing where the crowd started chanting something in Dutch. And I can sort of, I can remember it, but I can't say it because then all the people who speak Dutch are going to harass me forever for the bad pronunciation. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's basically about they're shouting something. Duh, duh, duh. And it's say, take your pants off and put them on your head. And I had no idea. People just started chanting there in Tilburg, I think, was the first time. But I can't remember. Could also be somewhere else. And uh, I didn't know what that meant. So I asked somebody from the crowd, like, I'm sorry, I have no idea what's going on. You're chanting something in your own funny language. So (laughs) what are you saying, you know? And then I made the huge mistake of giving him sort of the mic, or at least, you know, pointing it out. He's like, no, they're shouting, take your pants off and put it on your head. And wow. And I asked, are you serious? Yeah. And uh, so I took my pants off and put them on my head. <laughs> I mean, that's, that's, you know, that's performance art right there. That's amazing. Like I didn't know what to do. I mean, yeah. at the same time, you know, you want to entertain people, have fun. Yeah. And it was so random and weird. So I thought, what can I do to this? I can do nothing else than take my pants off and yeah. put them on my head. And I mean, that's, that's, I mean, those are, those are the things I love about live music stories like that. Like the things you least expect to happen at a show. I mean, I guarantee you every single person that was at that show will remember that for the rest of their lives and tell everybody about it. And that's, what's <laughs> great about live music is that when those things happen, like you have those memories, it's awesome. That's, that's, that's amazing, man. I, I well, no, I don't it's know. not only happened once, it's happened several times because after that, of course, people were filming it and it became a tradition. At one point, I even, before the on course, I went on and put an extra set of pants outside of the pants I had. <laughs> because then they had already been, ended up with doing that three times or something. So they asked, you know, when they started chanting, take your pants off and put them on the head. I was ready, like, okay, you wanted me to take my pants off and put them on my head? So I did really fast because I had already taken my shoes off and everything. Just dropped them and put them on my head. And then they realized they had another set of pants on. And yeah, I got seriously booed out for that. Oh, man, that's great. Man, well, thank you for sharing that. I honestly, I didn't know if that was, I didn't know the background of the story. So I didn't know if that was something you could fully elaborate on, but I'm glad you could, man. That's awesome. <laughs> um, well, man, I've, I've, taken up all of your time on the schedule that we have. I can't thank you enough for being here to do this with me. And um, I'm excited to see you guys seven months from now. Hopefully uh, I'll, I'll be seeing you in Nashville. Yeah. Bring your dad backstage. We'll have a beer after. Yeah, for sure, man. That'd be great. Well, for anybody listening, uh, Sabaton's latest album, The War to End All Wars is out now. If you're watching on YouTube, I'll make sure there's links where you can check it out. But Yo, Kim, thank you very much one more time. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day and evening, and hopefully I'll get to talk to you again soon. Yeah, thanks for having me on, and thanks to anyone who's listening or watching. Yep, take care, man. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Well, that was fantastic, man. I mean, what an awesome guy, just super laid back, easy to talk to, and we got a lot of information about that, too. For those of you that are listening or watching on YouTube that watch my YouTube reactions, You know that we've been talking about that music video for Race to the Sea for a while now. We've wanted to know what happened to all of that gear in the water, and we finally have our answers, man. That was really cool. I enjoyed hearing about that. And I'm also super excited to finally get a chance to see these guys live when they tour the U.S. with Epica at the end of this year. Coincidentally enough, like we talked about, they're playing in Nashville on my dad's birthday. So I'm hoping to bring him out for his first Sabaton concert as well. Hopefully meet the band and stuff like that. It's just super fun, man. The album is finally out. If you haven't heard it yet, it's absolutely fantastic. I think it's one of the best Sabaton albums they've released. Everything on it is great. The production, I specifically enjoyed how tasteful all the guitar solos were on this album. It's just awesome, man. Super awesome. Can't wait to see this show. Thank you once again to Joachim for being here. And I hope that you guys enjoyed this, man. I've got a lot of other artists that are lined up for episodes of this podcast. I'm hoping this is going to be a regular thing, maybe every couple weeks or so. But if you guys have any suggestions, as always, drop me a line. Let me know. Let me know if there's any artists you would like to see me have conversations with. And in the meantime, you can also check me out on YouTube. I stream regularly on Twitch. 
And this podcast is also available on Spotify, Apple, Google, and a lot of other places that you can listen to podcasts. I'm on a bunch of different social medias. My handle on everything is at tank the tech. Feel free to give me a follow to, you know, keep up with updates and a little behind the scenes of just my everyday life. But I'll be back again very soon for another episode, man. These are super fun. This is becoming one of my favorite things to do with my content lately. So wherever you are in the world listening and watching, thank you once again. Be safe, be kind to each other. And I'll be back very soon with another episode of the Back Lounge Podcast.